Your Excellencies, Honorable Delegates, Youth Advocates, I'm Omnayal Amroni, a plastic and reconstructive surgeon from Cairo, Egypt, and a member of the Global Youth Coalition for Road Safety. Today marks the launch of the Glasgow Declaration on the acceleration of the transition to zero cars and emissions. As a young medical doctor, I witness every single day patients suffering from asthma, as well as other respiratory diseases and cardiovascular diseases, all due to air pollution, which kills more than 7 million people every year, according to the World Health Organization, and leads to a global loss of over 1 trillion US dollars in health damages globally. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen how air pollution has aggravated the vulnerability of the individuals to the virus. Transportation is responsible for over 24% of the global carbon emissions, which lead to air pollution. Cutting down such carbon emissions has benefits for health economies, as well as reducing inequalities. And yet, action on reducing emissions is not happening fast enough. Not only does this transition to zero emission vehicles um, provide health benefits and save lives with a safe and a sustainable uh, road system, it ensures the provision of cleaner air, which leads to less non-communicable diseases, improves physical and mental health, as well as decreasing healthcare costs and economic costs that are incurred due to decreased productivity and premature death. Personally, I see the transition as the next best step that we need to take for the health of our communities and our planet. Now more than ever is the time for governments and all stakeholders to put the declaration into action and close the implementation gap through the use of proven evidence-based strategies that promote zero emission vehicles with calculated public health benefits of cleaner air and safer roads. As a young person who will be impacted today by the most by the decisions made, I call upon you all to work together to effectively make zero emission vehicles the new normal for current and future generations to come. Thank you. Your Excellencies, Honourable Delegates, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending Accelerating the ZEV Transition, a one-way street. My name's Helen Clarkson and I'm Chief Exec of the Climate Group. I'll be moderating this event where we'll be launching the COP26 declaration on accelerating the transition to 100% zero emission cars and vans and the Global Memorandum of Understanding on Zero Emission Medium and Heavy Duty Vehicles. The decarbonisation of road transport is crucial for us to reach our climate goals. So I'm just thrilled to be part of this event, showcasing those leading the transition to zero emission vehicles. A huge thank you to Omnia for sharing that important message, highlighting one of the vital benefits in transitioning away from polluting vehicles. And with that, I'd like to introduce Trudy Harrison, a minister from the Department of Transport to the left lectern, and Dutch Minister for the Environment, Stephen van Weyenberg, to the right lecture, uh, on the stage to launch the declaration and memorandum of understanding on zero emission vehicles. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning. It really is a pleasure to be here to launch COP26 Transport Day. We have been clear that the overarching aim of this COP is to keep the Paris temperature goal within reach. So it was clear that road transport, which accounts for 10% of global emissions, must be a priority. 
As a presidency, we have urged governments and manufacturers to commit to end the sale of polluting vehicles. And we decided to build up international collaboration to get the transition to zero emission vehicles moving faster. We know that success would not just be about the planet, but human health too. Because as Dr. Omnia El Omani has just said, air pollution from our roads is having a catastrophic effect. The faster we can move away from polluting vehicles, poisoning our air, the better. And that means moving to zero emission vehicles as part of a wider shift, including more cycling, more walking, and more public transport. The changes we have seen sweep through the automotive industry would have looked remote when we took the presidency. Since 2019, globally, the number of zero emission vehicles on the road has nearly doubled. When we took the COP presidency, no major vehicle manufacturer had committed to end the sale of polluting vehicles. Today, manufacturer commitments to phase out polluting vehicles represent more than 30% of the global manufacturing market. When the UK took the COP presidency, countries representing just 8% of global sales had commitments to phase out polluting cars. But since then, we've seen a string of announcements and proposals, including from the UK, Canada, Chile, and the European Commission. And today, countries with a date to end the sale of polluting vehicles entirely represent a fifth of global sales. Others, like US and China, have also made commitments to rapidly increase the sale of zero emission vehicles. And as a result, a report released by Bloomberg today predicts that 70% of new car sales globally will be zero emission by 2040. In 2016, they were predu pre predicting it would be just 35%. And there are clear signs that cars have turned a corner. The zero emission vehicle market is at a tipping point and the transition is irreversible, moving ever faster and possible sooner than we thought. We are on the cusp of a new age of road transport. An age of zero emissions, quieter roads, cleaner air and better health. And it's my pleasure today to launch the COP26 declaration on zero emission cars and vans, which crystallizes the progress that we have made in the last two years. For the first time, it brings together leading governments, cities, regions, businesses, financial institutions, and multilateral development banks. They commit to work together towards making sure every new car and van sold is zero emission by 2040 globally and by 2035 in leading markets. Whilst this progress is remarkable, there is further to go. And we must ensure that the transition to clean transport is global. So I'm pleased to announce today that the UK will make an initial contribution to four million pounds to the World Bank's new global facility to decarbonize transport. The fund will help mobilize $200 million over the next 10 years to support developing countries to decarbonize their transport faster. The COP26 Zero Emission Vehicles Council will also meet today to identify ways to support the transition in developing countries. And last week, 30 countries signed up to the Glasgow Breakthrough on Road Transport, committing to work together to make zero emission vehicles the most accessible, affordable and sustainable option in all countries by 2030. Today, we also have hugely encouraging events on shipping, aviation and freight, all setting out ambitious agendas towards net zero because we must replicate the success we have seen in zero emission vehicles in other sectors and drive even faster transformation across all transport sectors throughout this vital decade. And with that, I hand over to Minister Stephen van Weyenberg from the Netherlands, who has exciting progress to share on the transition to zero emission heavy goods vehicles. 
Thank you very much, uh, Trudy. Thank you for your leadership, and I applaud your efforts in the declaration you just presented on light-duty vehicles. And it's great to see such a broad support for all cars and vans to be fully zero emissions by 2035. This is indeed a good day for our challenging and necessary battle for a sustainable future and the right for everyone, all of our citizens, to breathe clean air. And our target date in the Netherlands is 2030 to phase out the sale of new carbon cars. An ambitious goal, but a feasible goal, if you look at the pace at which zero emission transport is developing. Nevertheless, you and I all know that we have to speed up. As COP President Alok Sharma said in his speech at the Zero Emission Vehicles Council last April, the growth of electric vehicles is increasing, but we need to go further and we need to go faster. So it's fantastic that we have more good news today. Today I'm proud to present a new Global Memorandum of Understanding on trucks and buses, an equally important and ambitious agreement to address this often overlooked sector, so-called medium and heavy-duty vehicles. For too long it was deemed too difficult to decarbonize, but technology is improving fast and costs are falling quickly. Almost every day new and revolutionary zero-emission trucks are coming onto the market. Manufacturers are investing in green innovations for a strong and competitive future for their own company. And by doing so, investing in a sustainable future, cleaner air and new green jobs. Just two weeks ago, I had the honor to join our Dutch King, Willem-Alexander, at the launch of a new zero emission public transport bus, designed and manufactured by the young Dutch company. You will probably not have heard of but you will be hearing of in the future, as of many other companies. With Coalstart, I'd like to thank them for their excellent cooperation, the Netherlands has led a global effort to bring together a leading group of countries to rally behind ambitious targets in a global memorandum of understanding, an MOU, as we present today. Many signatory countries will participate in today's panels, and I'm proud to present the global MOU on behalf of all of them. The purpose of the MOU is simple. To meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, we need carbon emissions to be net zero by 2050. Considering a 10-year turnover time for fleets, we need a full transition to zero emission medium and heavy duty vehicles in new fleets by 2040. And to stay on track, a 30% target of new trucks and buses sold to be zero emission by 2030, the overall aim of the global MOU. The global MOU is not a one-off declaration. Under the Drive to Zero campaign, the signatories of the global MOU intend to meet annually to discuss progress and plans and share their own experiences, with only one goal, to accelerate the deployment of zero emission trucks and buses. And nations are not alone in striving to make this ambition a reality. I'm pleased that many manufacturers, fleet owners, cities, states, regions, and infrastructure providers have also endorsed this global MOU. That common resolve gives me great confidence that we will transition rapidly to zero emission lorries and buses, and accelerating innovations, delivering clean technology jobs, better air quality and health, and in that way, a more sustainable climate. And by now, you may be wondering who has signed this MOU. And if you open the QR code, you will see the list of signatories and endorsers. And I see their support as a strong signal to speed up the transition to zero emission trucks and buses. But it is just the beginning. This is just the first step. And we all know we need more countries on the list to make this a global reality. To make a real difference, we need global commitment. And therefore, on behalf of all the signatories of the Global Memorandum of Understanding, I call on all other countries to join our efforts without delay. Together, we're stronger. Together, we're smarter. And if we want to drive to zero, we'd better get in the fast lane soon in order to reap the full range of benefits. So let's fasten our seatbelts and speed up to zero emission mobility. Thank you so much. Thank you to both of you for sharing the importance of both the declaration 
and the MOU. We're shortly going to be hearing from some of those who signed these declarations, and those really signal that we've reached the tipping point in the EV revolution. But before inviting them onto stage, I'd like to introduce a video that highlights the progress that's been made over the last 18 months in really speeding up this transition to zero emission vehicles. The analysis in this video was developed by Bloomberg New Energy Finance and has been published today. I'd now like to invite our first group of panellists uh, to come to the stage, as well as Bill van Amberg from CalStart, who will be chairing the discussion. If I can have all of our panelists please join us up on stage, that would be wonderful, and we'll get started here as soon as they do. This is such an exciting day, a phenomenal day when you really think about it. Uh, and I think Minister Harris made, Harris made this point. We often talk uh, about being at a threshold or a crossroads, but we are right now beyond the crossroads. Sometimes you get blocked at crossroads, they hold you back. Uh, we are moving forward on a new path with clarity, uh, an ambitious but achievable goal to reach clean air decarbonization and net zero for transport. Uh, this is what we're pushing forward to, and for the first time ever, through these two coordinated agreements, we have for road transport, cars, vans, buses and trucks, a unified global goal, a new standard that puts us on the pathway, as we said, to not just 100% zero emissions, but meeting our Paris requirements, meeting, if we can, 1.5C or below, but this puts us finally in the transport sector, the on-road sector, to do that. So the first, for the first time for all nations, we have a global standard to follow and to track. Now let us hear from some of the signatories and endorsers who are making this possible, who are the first movers who are really signing up to push us down this path. And we have a couple questions for this panel today. Uh, what is your country or company doing to support a fast transi transition to ZEVs? And what is the biggest benefit of that transition? Because this is really about creating a new future for transport and for our lives and jobs. So we're very honored to have a great panel. And if I can, let's start first today with Trudy Harrison, Minister and Department for Transport from the United Kingdom, who just spoke with us. Uh, the UK has been leapfrogging these, uh, these deadlines up. It has been so fantastic to see. And last year, you announced an ambitious intention to end the sale of new petrol di and diesel cars by 2030. How have you seen this announcement benefit the automotive industry in the UK? Thank you, and thank you really to everybody who's made this milestone pledge at COP26. It is truly inspiring to see governments and industry come together and agree measures to decarbonise road transport within a generation. I'm particularly encouraged by the leadership being shown by the vehicle manufacturers Volvo and Scania, who are sitting on this panel with me today. For so long, the motor car has been emblematic of rising carbon emissions and the damage that human activity inflicts on our planet. Now we have the opportunity to transform that image, for zero emission cars to become symbolic of our awakening to climate change, of our duty to reverse rising global temperatures as a matter of supreme urgency. 
Today marks a tipping point in the transition to clean road transport. We've really seen the momentum build over the last 18 months in the run-up to COP. And now it's time to start turning those good intentions into action. So some of the actions that we in the UK have been taken following the launch of the Prime Minister's 10-point plan for a green industrial revolution, where point four of that list was a commitment to zero emission vehicles. We've banned the sale of all petrol and diesel cars and vans from 2030. And we're committed that all vehicles to be sold, all cars and vans to be sold from 2035 will be zero emission. Building on the £1.9 billion we announced last year, we've committed an additional £620 million to support the transition of electric vehicles. And this will continue to roll out the charging infrastructure. We have 26,000 public charge points available today. 4,900 of those are rapid chargers, but it isn't enough. So we've announced a further commitment towards rolling out that infrastructure across the country. And a further £350 million to electrify our supply chain to create jobs and secure a competitive future for the sector. Through our Zero Emission Vehicle Transition Council and international work, we're collaborating with manufacturers and other autom automotive markets to accelerate transition. And we've really seen dramatic progress, with one in seven of all new vehicles sold in the UK having a plug on them. In particular, UK car manufacturers have been actively supportive of phase-out dates for petrol and diesel, and consumers are much more aware that this is the decade when everything changes. COP26, I'm sure, will accelerate preparations further. Of course, we still have a lot of work to do, bringing more partners on board, but we are incredibly confident of meeting our targets. Thank you so much. Uh, because we do feel at COP, uh, despite some of the talk outside, tremendous momentum. We were really hitting that point. If I could move next uh, to, the, to Volvo Cars, and we have the CEO, Hukan Samuelsson, who is here with us today. Volvo has been a real leader in this space in, in committing, and one of the first automakers to come forward and say, we will be 100% zero emissions uh, coming very soon. Uh, by 2030 is where you will be electrifying all of your platforms. Uh, what does this mean to your company to be on this leading edge? Uh, I mean, if you look into uh, transportation, I think it's around 10% of all the CO2 emissions. So it's definitely, we should be a part of the solution. And I think the car industry so far have been uh, too reactive. We should be much more proactive. And uh, with the electrification, I also believe we have a very good solution, not just solving the, the environmental problem, which I think is not enough. We should also create more attractive products for our consumers because then the process will be accelerated. And then consumers like electric cars. So, so I think we have come to a point where we should stop uh, in discussing and uh, trying to find a uh, other solutions. I mean, the, the grass is not greener on the other side. It's, it's very green on this side, and we should now start uh, electrifying our companies. And I think also it's a great opportunity for, for uh, the car industry in, uh, in Europe. And for sure, we have come to the mindset it's great for our company. This is an opportunity. And, and it makes our company stronger, and, and we can deliver products consumers, especially future consumers, will like to buy. I think that's really important, because if we can have the market working for better uh, environmental performance, it would be a great support instead of, of trying to, to delay it. So we have made uh, electrification and sustainability part of our business uh, 
based business, because I think you need to integrate it. You cannot just say, okay, let's make a couple of electric cars, but otherwise we, we continue as before. We need to make it a purpose, and I think we have experience with that exactly in that way we have been working with safety. And, and it's part of the core of our company, and, and the electric cars will in the same way be a core part of our business and it will make our company also more attractive for future talents and for future consumers. Excellent, and that is such a strong statement. Let's end the debate, let's move on and implement and get it done. Powerful words. Let's go next uh, to a big operator of vehicles on the global stage, Annabel Diaz. She's the regional general manager uh, for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa for Uber. Uber has introduced several initiatives, uh, Annabelle, supporting a fleet-wide transition to zero-emission vehicles. What has the reaction to this been, and what has been the benefit for your business? Yeah, well, first of all, we must all embrace this once-in-a-generation opportunity to clean up urban transport. And actually, Uber, we will play our part. And we have set ambitious targets in line with this declaration which include to be an emission-free mobility platform by 2030 in Europe and North America. This means that drivers on our platform will need to become the early mass adopters of EVs. And this is already happening. Actually, the drivers in Europe are switching much faster than the average consumer. The EV uptake in our platform is nearly five times quicker in key European countries. The percentage of kilometers driven on our app coming from EVs reached just over 4% in the first half of this year, in Europe specifically, which is a doubling in a year. But we do recognize that we need to increase this pace and there is still a lot to do. So we will redouble our efforts to help drive EV adoption. This Climate issue, this transportation issue is definitely a team sport, and we can't do this alone. Our success will be defined by how we work with the private sector, with the governments, with the cities, to make it cheaper for the drivers to adopt EVs. Our goal is to do this in countries all around the world. And this transition has to be available and achievable for everyone as quickly as possible. We will learn from the cities we operate all over the world, and we will translate best practices to basically ensure that the transition to EVs is a just one. Great. And, and that is so powerful because this is also part of the new business model for how people will move around, and it must be electrified. Let's move on to our next panelist, and it's a particular uh, delight for me because being a Californian, <laughs> I can welcome another Californian, Leanne Randolph. She's the chair of the California Air Resources Board, really one of the most influential agencies in the world, but coming from a subnational. Some people view California as a nation state. Uh, but it was one of the, the first state in the United States of America to announce a transition to zero emission cars and vans in 2035, and has also committed to this uh, significant a goal for heavy duty vehicles to be 100% zero emissions by 2040. Indeed, our global MOU is built on the backbone of what California has done with their advanced clean truck rule. Uh, Chair Randolph, what does the transition to clean vehicles mean for California across all modes? In California, we are moving full speed ahead towards the zero emission transportation future because it's critical to achieving both our climate targets and protecting public health. We're working closely across government and the private sector and communities to meet that 100% zero emission target that was set boldly by Governor Newsom. Our governor and legislature recently passed a historic budget committing almost $4 billion over the next three years to transportation electrification, both vehicles and infrastructure. These funds will scale the zero emission market towards sustainability increase access to zero emission vehicles for all communities, and provide emissions reductions to those communities that are most impacted by heavy duty transportation. 
Our agency is developing the next generation of clean car regulations, which will increase the market share of electric vehicles as well as clean up the last of the gasoline cars. And we have adopted the first in the world zero emission, legally enforceable truck manufacturing regulation and are adopting a complementary regulation that will put an end to medium and heavy duty combustion sales in California by 2040. Through partnerships with other US states that follow our clean air standards and our clean vehicle rules, the actions we take in California effectively send market signals to about 40% of the US market. We are helping to ensure a broadly based national zero emission vehicle market. And we're proud to be working with partners around the world to coordinate global efforts to decarbonize the transport sector, including through today's joint declaration and memorandum of understanding. As for the benefits we are experiencing as a result of that transition, Electric vehicles were California's largest single export in 2020, and we are coming up on 1 million zero emission vehicles sold in the state. And it's good business. We are seeing the private sector step up and work hard to make this transition. And even more critical than these economic benefits are the impacts to air quality and the public health benefits that will protect our most vulnerable communities. And that is what truly inspires this transition. And so looking forward to working with all of you as we operationalize this work. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think what, what is so powerful is some of the next jobs are going to be good jobs and need in infrastructure to get out there to actually support the vehicles in the vehicles, but also the infrastructure side, which I know is a big concern to our next panelist, uh, but also an opportunity. And he is Christian Levin. He is the CEO of Scania, representing Scania today. He also is the CEO of the Trayton Group. You notice you're the only uh, truck maker up here, uh, and that is wonderful because you have stepped out so far. Uh, last year, Scania pledged to phase out diesel by 2040, um, along with several other European truck makers. But then you stepped up farther in your commitments on zero emissions and your timeline for it. Uh, and you have even launched line haul or long haul trucks that will come to market in 2023. Why did you make this decision, and what does it mean for Scania's business? Yeah, th thank you, Bill. Uh, yes, yeah, as, as you said, we are, we are the leader in the sustainability journey in our industry than representing heavy commercial vehicles since many years. And as such, we have, for instance, developed a full range of, uh, of alternative fuel uh, vehicle program. And since 2019, we're working according to science-based targets. And doing so, we realized that the only way forward is electrification. And we have invested heavily into, into that technology ever since. And, we are actually, not many know it, but we are serial producing uh, heavy commercial trucks uh, in our factory in Södertälje alongside with, with the ICE engines. Uh, limited today to 28 tons, but as Bill just said, already by 2023, we see that technology is ready for uh, 40 ton, which is tra traditional long haulage uh, transport in Europe. Uh, we announced a couple of weeks ago that we are together with a, a logistic company in Sweden, Eula, developing a, a 64 ton truck. Um, and actually today we are announcing together with SCA, uh, the giant uh, paper pulp timber company in Sweden, that we're building a timber truck that is capable of transporting 80 ton uh, in North Sweden under the most difficult conditions, just to prove that the technology is ready. And, and then to answer on your question, why are we signing? Well, it feels very natural for us to endorse this MOU because the technology will not be the bottleneck. So, so with that, of course, I also have a couple of asks. And, and as California is doing, we need to make sure that the transporters find a, a suitable business case in investing in this technology. So a price on carbon is badly needed. Another thing is, of course, the grid. We need to make sure that our customers can charge. That is the first question we see when we discuss electric truck. And that is along the roads as well as in their depots. And of course, finally, up until the point the transition happens, it's extremely important that we don't lose focus on the alternative fuels, the biofuels, the HVOs, 
because that can do great part of the decarbonization work awaiting for when the park is, is fully electrified. So, so now we call upon countries and governments to work alongside with us to put down a roadmap market by market, and then I think we can actually be ready well ahead of 2040. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was inspiring, and thank you, because this is, this is what we need to do, is put our shoulder down and work it. I am delighted, uh, actually, to welcome our, our final panelist uh, for first comments. Uh, the nation of Turkey is actually a signatory to both the Declaration and the MOU, so covering the waterfront. And joining us today is uh, Ms. Mr. Orhan Solak, uh, who is with the, uh, direct, he's the Director General of the Presidency of Climate Change for Turkey. Turkey has signed the MOU and, that is, that is, and the Declaration. You also have a robust manufacturing industry in transport, both for components and for vehicles. What does this transition to zero emissions then mean for Turkey? Why is it so important? Thank you, Mr. Chair. As we all know, the mobility sector is the second largest sector that causes carbon dioxide emissions. With the increasing urbanization and population, the importance and necessity of advanced mobility vehicles and technologies are increasing each passing day. New technologies are rapidly transforming traditional structures dating back to the last century. In this context, electric mobility is undoubtedly one of the most prominent concepts. As Turkey, we believe that call for mobility will create a significant leverage effect in achieving the goals set under this roadmap. In the mobility roadmap, some of the targets we have set for 2030 are as follows. Reaching at least 75% localization rate in electric vehicle. Having 35% market share for electric vehicle sales in total. Installation of 250,000 charging sockets. Completing charging infrastructure in electric vehicles. Being the leader in Europe and one of the top five in the world in the production of electric, connected, and autonomous light and heavy commercial vehicles. Being a regional battery production center. As you can see, our targets for zero emission vehicles are in full compliance with this declaration and MOU that we have launched today. And as Turkey, we are pleased to be a part of these initiatives. Another significance of these initiatives comes also from the international cooperation they will provide in the upcoming period. As the customs union partner of the EU, Turkey exports 80% of its automotive production to the EU member states. Therefore, we are closely following the EU regulations and carrying out simultaneous transposition of the EU legislation. Last but not least, we support the declaration and the MOU since they will accelerate the meeting the goals of the Paris Agreement. By involving the, uh, a wide range of representatives of major automotive industries, these two initiatives take the transition to zero emission vehicles to a global scale. Recent studies show that an ambitious zero emission vehicle transition may conclude a 61 reduction 61% reduction in CO2 emissions worldwide as of 2050. This is a huge potential, and as Turkey, we are excited about the positive contribution we can make to climate change globally, as well as realizing our national goals through all kinds of bilateral and multilateral cooperation aimed at the transition to zero emission vehicles. As I end my remarks here, I would like to express my gratitude on behalf of my country to all parties who contributed to the preparation of this declaration and MOU and the organization of this event. And I respectfully greet you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think what we're hearing here is so powerful. We know we need to do it. We must act for climate. We must do it for the clean air in our cities, which must happen at the same time. But we also must do it for our new economy and for moving our people together forward. And I think we're hearing powerful economic reasons and industrial reasons why this makes so much sense. 
We have just a few moments left, but I would like to actually ask for some quick comments from our panelists on what do we need to be working together on next. We've heard about infrastructure, there's finance, there's other things. I'd like to quickly get, Minister Harrison, can we, may we speak with you first on that? Certainly, and thank you for the challenge. I think it is many things, but certainly sharing data, sharing an understanding of infrastructure rollout will be particularly helpful for countries all over the world as we transition from a fossil fueled economy to a decarbonised economy, particularly in relation to transport and actually across all modes, ensuring that this is a benefit to not just the environment, to society, for us in the UK, it's about levelling up and making sure that all parts of the UK benefit from the changes that we're bringing in enthusiastically and with swift action. Thank you so much. Hukan, any thoughts that you'd like to share on what do we need to do next and faster? Yeah, it's, uh, if you look, if we now have electric cars, of course, then infrastructure for charging has been said many times. Uh, I'm not too nervous about that. I think the market will solve that as cars come out on the road. But the big elephant is, of course, the primary energy need to be fossil free. Uh, and that's where I think also is the beauty of such a clear declaration, because if we now say end date, I think we will also have to start thinking about the primary energy. I think that's good. We have to work then also in the supply chain because we have a lot of embedded CO2 in our cars. We need to look into how to produce steel fossil fuel, uh, fossil free, and, and, and we do that uh, together with SSAB. And very important, battery production must also be fossil free, otherwise you will built in uh, more than you gain with the car. Uh, and that's where we also work then with Northvolt. So it's embedded CO2 in the whole supply chain and primary energy, I think, are the big things we need now to really uh, work with together. Excellent. And the benefits of a unified goal that we can all follow gives us clear clarity on where we need to go. Annabelle, some quick thoughts from you. Yeah. Well, I can only insist on the topic of infrastructure development, availability, and different uh, solutions uh, for EV charging. This is actually one of the main bottlenecks our commercial drivers still face when switching to an EV, and making the cost of operating an EV still higher than a traditional car in many, many cities and countries around the world. That's a fundamental topic. But alongside that topic, also keep developing enabling policies that will make this transition, and the transition to, in general, an efficient transportation network that the technology can allow possible and fast. Because we need to really think mobility, thinking multimodal, and thinking integration of systems. Thank you so much. And thinking of uh, going faster, our panel is almost to an end, but if I can have some quick thoughts, first from Chair Randolph. I think in this transition, we need to be very mindful of equity. We need to make sure that these uh, new vehicles are available to as many uh, folks as possible. And we need to be uh, mindful of uh, sourcing our materials, reusing and recycling our materials in ways that don't impact vulnerable communities even further. So we need to be, have a clear mind towards equity as we do this work. Excellent point. Christian? Uh, yes, no one buys a commercial vehicle because they like it. They buy it as a piece of uh, a piece of production equipment, part of a logistic chain, um, and they need uh, to get the total cost of ownership, the famous TCO right, so that they get return on investment. I think that will be the biggest challenge that we make sure that it's a good business case to go completely fossil free and emission zero emission. That that's our biggest challenge, and that that requires that we work together across all sectors and, and with policymakers. Yeah, and that's why this global alignment is so important, that it's not just for cars, it's not just for vans, it's, it's for buses, trucks, and across on-road. Exactly. Final thoughts, if we can, from Mr. Solak on this point. What, what, what do we need to push forward faster and do it now? Yes, of course, um, there are important barriers and challenges in this uh, MOU and declaration when we are looking such as higher electrical vehicle prices, 
compared to low cost inter internal combustion in engine vehicles. Lack of the regulation is another issue. And inadequate charging infrastructure and lack of public awareness. These are important issues. However, we also have great opportunities mm -hmm. in making this transition quicker, easier, and cheaper for all. We believe that much progress will be made both in the production and electrical vehicles and also on the side of charging a legal infrastructure by means of a strong international co collaboration uh, needed for this purpose. All right. Well, thank you so much. We, we clearly now have a global goal. We have a North Star. We've moved past the crossroads that were holding us back and we've moved down the path. It's clear, it's hard, it's achievable. And I think even a few years ago, we would have thought heavy duty trucks in Northern Sweden carrying logs, it can be done. And if it can be done there, we take off the table this talk of difficult duty cycles that maybe we can't electrify, we can but we need to put our shoulders to the wheel and get it done. Uh, so this is so exciting for us. The job is now we're past the crossroads. Now it's time to implement. We are dedicated to it. With the MOU, we will be working with the existing first signatories, but adding more signatories over the next year. So thank you so much. Let's really thank our panelists of first movers. Uh, they have done such a great job in giving us this, uh, this idea. And I hand the uh, floor, Helen, back over to you. Thank you very much to all of you for being part of our first panel. It's really great to hear about the ambitious steps being taken to increase the pace of this transition. And thank you so much to Bill and for all your work chairing this discussion, but really your amazing work supporting transport decarbonisation at CalStart. So this morning, as well as uh, this event, we've launched a new website which will host the COP26 declaration on ZEVs. You'll be able to find all of those who've signed the declaration, and it's a really fantastic list of supporters. And we're now going to watch a few clips from other ministers and industry leaders who are supporting this work. We must go faster. We must go faster. We must go faster. We must all go faster. We got to go faster. We must go faster. And we must go faster. 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 And we must go faster. We must go faster. We must go faster. Because the future is for zero emission vehicles. I need to go faster. You need to go faster. And all the world and all the countries need to go faster. In Denmark, we're very ambitious. The last new car with internal combustion engine is to be sold no later than 2030. And that's why I'm very glad that so many countries have gone together, businesses, regions, everyone, and say, we want to sign this very ambitious declaration because the future is for zero emission vehicles. Greetings, I am Marta Suplicy, Municipal Secretary of International Relations for the City of Sao Paulo. The launch of the Transport Day Declaration is an opportunity for stakeholders worldwide to show their support for such a central topic for the next decade. Here in Sao Paulo, we have been working in alignment with the decarbonization goals proposed by the declaration. We are currently mobilizing our most enthusiastic efforts in order to achieve our targets for fully transforming our municipal bus fleet towards zero emission by 2040, as is stated in our climate action plan, Pelen Clima. Our goals program also foresees a change in 2,600 vehicles or 20% of our total, 14,000 already by 2024. All these milestones are key to ensuring that Sao Paulo will fulfill its goal to become an increasingly greener and sustainable city where climate action is a priority. Our ambition and responsibility as an automaker is to help fight climate change by making individual mobility 
free of emissions. We joined the ZEV declaration to reinforce this goal and stand with our fellow signatories in working toward a future of zero emission cars and vans. At our company, we have accelerated our plan to fully and rapidly electrify our products. And we've laid out a clear strategy on how we will get there. In 2025, we will take the step from EV first to EV only. From that year forward, all new Mercedes vehicle architectures will be purely electric. And by the end of this decade, we will be ready to go 100% electric wherever market conditions allow. In addition, as early as the beginning of next year, all global passenger car and battery assembly sites run by Mercedes-Benz AG will switch to carbon neutral production. Still, while the e-mobility ramp up continues to gain traction, the charging infrastructure lags behind. To catch up, we need better coordination and a comprehensive approach involving all regions. Political decision makers need to accelerate the buildup of a comprehensive electric charging and hydrogen refueling infrastructure. I'm convinced that tomorrow's mobility cannot be shaped by bans and regulations alone. What we need is a fair global competition that produces the best solutions and technologies. We also need alliances because the only way we can win the fight against climate change is by acting together. The fact that countries, regions, cities and companies from around the globe have jointly signed this declaration builds my confidence that our ambitious goals for the transformation of the mobility sector are within reach. I firmly believe that by working hand in hand, we can succeed in making individual mobility CO2 neutral. We must go faster, and I hope by leading the way, others will soon follow our ambition. And if you'd like to see further content from those supporting the COP26 Cars and Vans Declaration, please head to www.cop26transport.declaration.org, which we launched this morning. And I'd now like to welcome to the lectern Matthew Baldwin, Deputy Director General for DG Move in the European Commission to the stage. Matthew will be sharing how the European Commission is supporting a faster transition to zero emission vehicles. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Delighted to be with you this morning. The European Commission welcomes the declaration we've just been hearing about as part of a broader push towards sustainable mobility. So we're very grateful for the chance to set out our views on these extremely important issues and to put it in a slightly broader transport context. The European Green Deal pledges to make the EU the first climate neutral continent by 2050 and sets a 55% reduction target by 2030 as the key stepping stone towards that. We're backed for the first time by a European climate law, which makes this 55% reduction legally binding on the member states of the European Union. It's not whether we reduce emissions by 55%, it's how we do it. So the next imperative, of course, is to set out the detailed plans to ensure that emissions come down sharply in all sectors. Transport, as we've heard, is responsible for about 25% of all emissions. We need to cut our transport emissions by 90% by 2050, which is why we came forward with our sustainable and smart mobility strategy adopted in 2020 and now being rolled out as part of our Fit for 55... <laughs> it's impossible to pronounce. Fit for 55 uh, package in July, a balanced mixture of instruments using market instruments such as carbon pricing combined with regulatory measures. As part of this, shifting rapidly to zero emission vehicles is indispensable, but on its own, it's clearly not going to be enough. It is, as we say, necessary but not sufficient. Moving towards a zero emission fleet should be part of a broader approach to sustainable and smart multimodal mobility. All of our modes must be sustainable which means, for example, we need to boost the role of sustainable aviation and maritime fuels. We also need to ensure that sustainable alternatives to cars are available. We need much more use of rail transport, highlighted in the European Year of Rail 2021. In our cities, we need more use of public transport. We need more walking, more cycling as part of the move towards climate-neutral cities by 2030. So, 
as part of this great declaration today, please let's not lose sight of the bigger picture. Specifically, however, on zero emission vehicles, stronger CO2 emissions standards for cars and vans will accelerate this vital transition to zero emission mobility. The European Commission has proposed to require that the average emissions of new cars should come down again by 55 percent from 2030 compared to 2021 levels and all the way down to 100 percent by 2035. That proposal is now on the table of our member states and on the table of the European Parliament. In addition, our proposals for the revised alternative fuels infrastructure regulation will require member states themselves to drive hard for the deployment of the related infrastructure. We need to ensure that consumers can recharge or refuel anywhere in the European Union without hassle. And these efforts are further complemented by the proposal for the revision of the Renewable Energy Directive. This seeks to strongly increase the share of renewable transport fuels. And under the Energy Taxation Directive, we're going to align the taxation of energy products with our overall energy and climate policies. And last but not least, you'll have heard a lot about it in the last week or so, the ETS. For many years already, the European Union's emissions trading system has been a cornerstone of our climate policy framework. It delivers tangible emission reductions. We will lower the overall emission cap even further. We're going to increase its annual rate of reduction, and we're going to extend emissions trading to new sectors, including road transport. And last but not least, fairness, equity, and solidarity are an essential part of our policy architecture. For example, as part of our package in July, we've proposed a new social climate fund to provide dedicated funding to our member states to help citizens finance investments in energy efficiency, in new heating and cooling systems, and indeed in cleaner mobility. So the EU is as ambitious on transport as we are in other sectors, and zero emission vehicles will play an important role in our plans as part of that bigger agenda to ensure sustainable mobility overall. We'll continue to pursue this partnership, uh, this agenda, with industry, with other countries right across the world. And so it's been great for me to have this opportunity today to share these plans with you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Matthew. We look forward to seeing how the proposal under the Fit for 55 package progresses over the next year. We're shortly going to hear from our second panel on the importance of international collabor collaboration in transitioning to zero emission road transport. And to moderate that panel, we'll be joined by Nigel Topping, the UN High Level Climate Action Champion, to chair the discussion. So if the second panel could join us on stage, and Nigel, and while they do that, please enjoy another video. COP26 presents a unique opportunity for new action, so we can meet our emissions goals and build a better world for future generations. Cleaning up road transport is central to this challenge. 17% of global carbon dioxide emissions come from road transport. These emissions are rising faster than those of any other sector. To meet our Paris Agreement goals to keep 1.5 Celsius within reach, we need to dramatically increase the pace of the global transition to zero emission vehicles so that globally, all new vehicles are zero emission by 2040 or by 2035 in leading markets. Fortunately, this transition is already underway. More and more people have been making the switch to electric vehicles. There are now over 12 million passenger electric vehicles, 1 million commercial electric vehicles, and over 260 million electric two- and three-wheelers on the road globally today. These electric vehicles are already displacing well over 1 million barrels of oil demand per day. And this shift is rapidly accelerating. Since 2019, the number of truly zero-emission vehicles on the road has nearly doubled in size. There is now an economic imperative to making this transition to electric vehicles. This transition now makes business sense with vehicle manufacturers racing to be leaders in this new global market. Over the past two years, nine major vehicle manufacturers have committed to ending the sale of polluting cars by 2035 globally and over 100 large fleet-owning businesses have committed to making their fleets 
100% zero emission by 2030. Leading governments have already committed to end the sale of all polluting cars by 2035 or earlier. This shifts the international picture significantly and the more countries come forward with this commitment, the faster investment will shift and the faster costs will fall. Last year, the first of its kind, Zero Emission Vehicle Transition Council was set up bringing together ministers from the biggest and most progressive automotive markets who have the power to shift the global market to work together to make this transition quicker, cheaper and easier for everyone. For consumers, zero emission vehicles are due to reach cost parity with polluting vehicles by the middle of this decade, and they are already cheaper to run. This global transition will also offer huge opportunities for jobs, economic growth, as well as cleaner air and improved public health. We also need to ensure that the transition to zero emission vehicles is truly global. A truly global and just transition ensures no country or community is left behind. Through international collaboration and strengthening the international support offer, we can make this a reality. The transition to zero emission road transport technology has reached a tipping point. It is inevitable, underway, and by working together, it is accelerating. But there's still more to do and we must go faster. Let's make zero emission vehicles the new normal by making them accessible, affordable and sustainable in all regions by 2030. Um, good, good morning everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to open the second panel on international collaboration. Um, you know, as, as high level champion, um, I, I've been given a mandate by the parties to, who, who wrote the Paris Agreement to drive radical collaboration amongst non-state actors, so <clears throat> companies, banks, investors, cities, states and regions, but of course non-state actors also need to work in partnership with national governments, what, what we call the ambition loop. Sometimes national governments can go further and faster, sometimes um, uh, non-state actors. Um, so it's, it's great to be here to explore how that kind of collaboration can drive the sort of exponential change that we need. I'm delighted to have such a strong panel um, representing governments, investors, businesses on the supply side and the demand side to explore what have we learned so far about international collaboration and what do we need to do in the next phase to keep accelerating. Um, and, and before I go to the rest of the panel, I'd like to start by inviting uh, Sudendu Jyoti Sina, who's the vice chairman at Niti Aayog in India, um, to take the left lectern to launch the EV web portal, um, which is a great example of international collaboration between the UK uh, and India. And then, then we'll move to the rest of the panel. We have Cynthia Williams, um, the global director of Ford, Stephanie Pfeiffer, um, who leads the IGCC's work mobilizing investors in Europe, Christian Seaman, who's the VP and CSO at General Motors, um, Omar Al Gabra, the Minister for Transport in Canada, Mike Lightfoot, the Chief Corporate Affairs and Sustainability Officer at Lease Plan, and Nancy Karagithu, the Principal Secretary at the State Department for Shipping and Maritime in Kenya. So with that, over to you, Sudendu. Uh, thank you, Nigel. Your Excellency, distinguished speakers and panelists, and ladies and gentlemen, the role and significance of international cooperation, collaboration, in making transition to ZEV a reality is all the more clear now. These collaborations will facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning and knowledge exchange programs on transitioning to a zero emission vehicle. They would act new perspectives, increase learning from tried and trusted strategies. Successful international collaborations will bring openness and cross-pollination of ideas and help to explore broad range of solutions to reach the ZEV, which is targets. Now, this is not only true for the cars and the vans and the buses and the trucks, but also for the two-wheelers and three-wheelers, which constitutes almost 80% in India's fleet strength. After all, it is the emission, reducing it, that is our target, regardless of the vehicle segment. We at Niti Aayog, National Institution for Transforming India, Government of India, have collaborated with the government of UK
to develop a one-stop interactive electric mobility web portal. We have developed it on the lines of UK's Go Ultra Low awareness campaign. Now, this collaboration is a part of our wider EV awareness campaign. This will catalyze additional investments in India in priority areas of electric mobility, knowledge exchange and capacity building programs at various levels, thereby promoting long-term demands and addressing barriers of faster uptake of electric mobility. Now with this, I would like to launch the awareness portal eAmrit, eAmrit, A-M-R-I-T, Accelerated E-Mobility Revolution for India's transportation. We appreciate <laughs> we appreciate President COP26 and the entire team of UK mission in India and in the UK who have put in tremendous efforts in various COP26 engagements with India to take this global reception forward. Thanks, thank you. Thanks to all the participants. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Vice Chairman Senior. I think a um, really good example of the importance of state action, but also communication to, or, to, to citizens, because sometimes it can be quite an overwhelming and complex um, transition. Um, I'd, I'd like now to bring in um, the voice of the, the vehicle industry, start with um, Cynthia Williams, who's the Global Director of Ford. Um, Cynthia, it'd be great to hear a bit about how you see the role of international collaboration so far in getting to, to the bold commitments you've made, but also what are you going to need in terms of international collaboration going forward to ensure that this transition is in all global markets? Thanks, Nigel. Uh, from Ford's perspective, I think in order to continue to lead uh, the electrification revolution, we need to partner together uh, with others uh, just to bring um, battery costs down, uh, to, to bring component um, engineering uh, to local and regional areas uh, that we can m ensure uh, that we're uh, building uh, efficiently and effectively. For Ford, we, we not only want to build high quality uh, vehicles at scale, but we want to do so in a way that it saves, um, it's good for the planet and it's good for the environment. I think uh, from an automotive perspective, uh, being able to scale up and um, bring vehicles at scale, that's needed now. We need to match our ambitions with our actions. And so to me, that's gonna be key uh, for all automotive uh, manufacturers to do so. Uh, we're committed not only to reducing greenhouse gases of our vehicles, but also making our, our manufacturing facilities and our uh, supply chain more efficient. And so I think that that's something we all can work together as well as we share some, you know, we share the supply chain together. And so we, we need to work together on that. Moving forward, I think uh, key things that we will need uh, to move this, to accelerate the electrification revolution is to continue, uh, we need incentives. Incentives are required in order to bring the cost down and so that we can get more people into the vehicles. It's key to leave no one behind. We need infrastructure. We need infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. People need to see infrastructure in order to get in the vehicles and feel comfortable that they can get to from point A to point B with no issues. And then education, education is needed. We need to educate consumers with regard to uh, the, the technology, teach them how to uh, demonstrate the cost of um, ownership and, and measure that on, uh, you know, for themselves and get them in the vehicles. Thank you. Great, Th thanks Cynthia. You can already see the links with you know, that, your last point about education with the e Amrit launch. Um, and, and then I'm thinking, we're gonna go to, to Stephanie Pfeiffer from the IAGCC. Um, the, Stephanie, um, we heard a little bit from Cynthia about the importance of clear signals from um, the businesses themselves and, uh, and, and governments, which will help incentivize investment in, um, in batteries, for example. Um, but we, we know that investors um, have a huge role in, in driving the transition. You've been leading a lot of that in terms of European investor collaboration. 
um, in terms of the relationship between investors and the businesses they hold, but also in terms of the signals they send to policymakers. Tell us a little bit about um, the role that you see investors themselves collaborating, actually, um, in accelerating this transition. Yeah, thanks very much, Nigel, and good morning, everyone. So one of the key ways that investors can drive progress towards net zero is by engaging with the companies that they invest in to really encourage them to align their business strategies to the Paris Agreement. And through Climate Action 100 Plus, which is the world's largest collaborative investor engagement initiative, we have over 600 investors with more than $60 trillion in assets engaging with 167 of the world's highest emitting companies on setting net zero transition strategies, on improving their climate change governance, and on strengthening their climate-related financial disclosures. And as a result of this engagement, 110 of those companies have already set net zero commitments, including over half of the auto companies that are included in the initiative. And as you've seen before the COP, there's been huge momentum in investors themselves setting net zero commitments. And you've now got over half of global assets in the world committed to net zero. And engagement with companies and the transport sector as well will play a really key role in investors themselves then meeting their commitments. So you can see some acceleration in that. But we also recognize that decarbonizing is not something that any company can do on its own in isolation. And we will need to see much stronger collaboration also between value chains. So investors are committed to bringing different sectors together to, to make progress jointly. And then policy clarity is, of course, really, really important for investors to align their portfolios. We've been calling for key milestones and decarbonization pathways from governments for those carbon-intensive se sectors. We launched the Global Investor Statement to Government, which is supported by over 700 investors. And so it's really, really great to see that we have very specific dates of sales of new car and cars and vans being net zero emissions. And that will support our investor engagement with companies as well going forward. So wonderful that investors, companies, and governments are now collaborating on this really, really important topic. Great. That, thanks so much, Stephanie. I think you know, that Climate Action 100 Plus has been going for a few years now. It seems to really have some very, it's sending a very clear signal to those 167 companies. Um, so let, let me turn to, to Kristen Seaman now, um, VP and, and, and CSO at General Motors. So another, again, on the supply side. Um, so investors are asking for it. A l growing number of countries are setting clear phase out dates. You've signaled your intention to completely transition to reserves by 2035. Um, so the real question for me from, to you is, how will international collaboration um, help support General Motors achieving that goal, particularly in countries that haven't yet set a clear phase-out date? Thank you. So at GM, we see a, a world of all electric where everyone can be part of it and everyone can enjoy the benefits of an electric vehicle. For us, that means a portfolio of vehicles that crosses every segment and every price point. It's about having infrastructure and access to charging for everyone. It's about equitable climate action so that communities that traditionally have been left behind or are disproportionately affected by climate change are really coming along on that transformation with us. As we've talked about today, we cannot reach that future that we envision alone. It's going to take us working together with investors, with policymakers, with others in the industry to make sure that we develop those innovations and technologies that we need for that all-electric future. Our approach is working closely with others in the industry and really a network of leaders around developing that charging infrastructure, things like ride sharing and others that can really benefit from a fully electric future. Right. Thank, th thank you, Kristen. Um, uh, you know, it, I think it's really important in one of the signals today that we have, you know, really high volume vehicle manufacturers committing to the, the full the full transition. It's, and it's it's really 
Uh, I mean, we talk a lot about the need for system. You know, the placard say systems change, not climate change. I think that's what we're seeing. You know, governments, the supply side, demand side, cities, investors, all um, um, committing to and collaborating towards the same goal. So on that topic of country-to-country of, of -country collaboration and how that can spark broader collaboration, let me turn to um, Omar, Omar al Gabra, the Minister for Transport in Canada. Um, you know, Canada has got a great reputation for working collaboratively to try and, well, to create, I don't know what the word for this, or clubs of the willing or clubs of the ambitious, um, you know, uh, particularly um, well-known and, and it was a big feature of the growth last week of the Powering Pass Coal Alliance. Um, how do you see that countries um, and other actors can work together to accelerate the transition, to, to grow the signatories to the, to the declarations we've heard today? Uh, thank you very much, Nigel. Um, let me just first say that Canada is extremely proud to be uh, a signatory of the UK-led declaration on a transition to zero emission vehicles. We're also a proud signatory of the MOU led by the Netherlands and Cal CalStart, uh, for medium and heavy duty trucks. Earlier this year, our government announced uh, that we are uh, accelerating our own mandate for zero emission vehicles. Uh, and we're, we're mandating that 100% of new cars and light duty vehicles be zero emission vehicles by 2035. Um, that is a massive um, a transformation, um, not only for consumer behavior, but it's also for production, uh, for supply chains, uh, for rules and harmonizing standards. And given the pace and the magnitude of this opportunity, it works best if there is a cross-border collaboration with other countries, with manufacturers, with uh, st other stakeholders, including non-governmental sectors. So, it, the, the opportunity before us is massive. The challenge is also massive. But the, the collaboration, the willingness of, of working together to achieve this goal is what will make it possible. And, and maybe I'll just ask you a follow-up, because, of course, you, I mean, you have a big um, manufacturing footprint, I mean, GM and Ford and, and, and supply chains. One thing we haven't heard anything about yet is the, the just transition and, and, and the implications of jobs of this transition. How do you factor that into your thinking about long-term long goals and the planning to get there? This is actually, we actually see this as a massive opportunity for job creations. Uh, we have already been uh, partnered with uh, automakers uh, in, in Canada uh, to produce uh, electric or zero emission vehicles. Canada is one of the few countries in the world that has all the minerals required for battery production. So we also offer a unique advantage for supply chains and, and raw material. Um, so yes, we see this as a great opportunity for new businesses, for new jobs that will help our workers and also combat climate change. Great. And that, that, I think there's a similar dynamic. I'm working with Gonzalo Munoz, the other high-level champion. I mean, Ch Chile recently also announced a full phase out, and again, I think they, they also see the, the, the big opportunity on that side, um, being a big mineral producing nation as well. Thank, thank you, Omar. Um, so now, I'm going to turn to the demand side. Um, Mike Lightfoot is the Chief Corporate Affairs um, and Sustainability Officer at LeasePlan. Um, Mike, LeasePlan were one of the first um, uh, and biggest to join um, uh, the Climate Group's EV100 campaign, I don't know, like maybe four years ago, it makes you sound yeah. like some kind of visionary. Makes me old. Yeah. 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 Um, ha, so in that time, you know, because I think when you've made that commitment that all 1.8 million vehicles, if I remember, will be electric by 2030 in your yeah, case. you got it. How have you seen this international collaboration evolve since then when maybe you were one of, one of a few lonely voices, now it's quite a big tent, right? How's that evolved? Uh, well, I think when, when we joined the Climate Group's EV100 organization in 2030, oh, sorry, in 2017, everyone thought we were mad. Yeah. So we have uh, around 2 million vehicles on the road across 30 countries. We're the world's largest fleet manager, mainly serving large corporates with passenger vehicles and LCVs. Um, but we really thought, okay, electric is really where the whole debate is moving to. Um, back then, there were issues around cost, around model availability, around range. Um, 
you know, I think we can say now that those issues, particularly in the passenger vehicle market, not really maybe in the LCV market, but those issues have all been solved. So what we see from our large corporates um, is that, you know, the debate is over. The, they want to go electric. Their regulators are pushing them, particularly if they're financial institutions have, and they have to disclose the climate impact of their activities. Their investors, you know, anytime they do a capital raise, they're gonna get a huge questionnaire. They wanna know, you know, where their emissions are coming from and what they're gonna to do to drive down their emissions profile. Their customers want it. Um, so what we've seen is that there's a, there's a huge coalition there that wants to go electric and that the, the, the models are there. The result is actually the transition has been much faster than what we expected. So we're already around one in five uh, new orders for electric cars. So that's, you know, from, or from one in a hundred, I think when we first joined. So it's gone, it's gone really fast and much faster than we expected. Um, you know, long term about making sure that we, you know, hit our goal or making sure that you know everyone goes electric i mean it's really simple it's about mindset it's about ceo saying we want to make the switch we want to look across all our 30 countries or however many countries we're in uh, and you know do our best to transition as soon as possible yes there are issues around charging infrastructure that also needs to be addressed i think a colleague from general motors said um you know for uh, for that mindset to be there people have to see it right so they have to see the cars on the road um and they have to see the infrastructure so yeah basically our message is just get started it's possible great and really interesting mike that the 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 issues which need collaboration shift right from cost, model availability, range to um, charging infrastructure. I think that's kind of typical of these sort of systems changes that it's one barrier after another we have to learn. Thank, th thank you, really helpful. Um, and now I, I want to talk to um, uh, Nancy Karagithu, who's the Principal Secretary of the State Department for Shipping and Maritime in Kenya. Um, now, we know that we need to make, uh, to meet the Paris goals, this needs to be a global transition. So in order to make the zero emission vehicles the new normal by um, the 2030s, we've got to make sure that it's all markets and that there's not a kind of twin track approach and we avoid the, the unintended consequences of secondhand polluting vehicles in one part of the world being dumped um, in another part of the world. Um, so, so what more can leading markets and emerging markets do to make sure that this is a transition which happens at the same time and is not a twin track transition? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Let me start by saying that uh, as a government, Kenya is committed to the increased ambition of both adaptation and mitigation actions acceleration uh, and the transition to the zero emission vehicles and to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. And of course, um, what we know or what we consider is that having policy guidance and regulation, both at international and national level, cascaded down is very, very important to ensure just the kind of result uh, you have said it. And being uh, an aspiring industrialized, industrialized country without the risk of uh, having to adapt so much in our industry is building stronger and green at the same time. This becomes very, very important. And that said, I want to say that uh, the government has been very keen to, you know, to provide the policy, the kind of policy guidance that ensures that this happen, happens in, in terms of, uh, you know, sending the right message. Some of the things that government has done is coming up with national, integrated national policy level with very clear messaging. Uh, fiscal incentives, very, very important, and therefore the National Treasury has taken this up and provided the right guidance with the right incentives in terms of uh, the importation and the you know, reduction of duties in order to ensure that this happens. And we've also developed and adopted standards which makes sure, therefore, that the, the vehicles, electric vehicles we get, and this is as far as, uh, as 2018, so that the standards are already there to ensure that we don't become a dumping ground, like you've said. And the National Treasury has also developed a green fiscal policy in order to guide in terms of appropriate 
incentives in, in the wider transport economy. But that said, let me say that we've got a young, a, you know, young generation that is very technical, uh, you know, driven, uh, you know, so they are very ready to be able to incubate and also to, to be able to pilot demonstrable uh, technology in, in, the, in the industry as a leeway to uh, a safe transition, not just in Kenya, but also in the region. But most important is to say that policy guidance and government has taken very, very strong control on this to ensure that it doesn't happen in a free market which then encourages the kind of dumping that you're talking about. Yeah. And it, it was great. I, I managed to get to visit Kenya earlier in the year to the, uh, the, the forest park in, in Nairobi, where um, the UNEP are uh, partnering to launch e-boda bodas. That's an e-motorbike. E and motorbike taxis are a big deal. There. The other thing that, of course, improves the quality of air in the city, also gives the boda boda drivers uh, more income. Um, yeah. But the people who loved it the most were the park rangers. Because if you're a park ranger, you're trying to sneak up on people doing bad stuff. So an electric motorbike is much better because it's quiet. Um, uh, I think also, in, in, interestingly, again, maybe a different but similar to, to Canada, of course, Kenya has an opportunity, with it, given its geothermal and solar um, resources, to be a net exporter of, uh, of energy. So transforming the mobility system to one which runs off kind of homegrown energy also has an energy security element. Look, I, I, I've been geeking out about this. Um, uh, in, maybe I've been dreaming of this event for like a, a, a long time, it, almost as long as um, um, uh, Mike's been in, in the EV100, in fact, even longer, right? Um, so it's very exciting to me to see systems change in action. We have all actors in the system supply side, demand side, regulators, providers of capital. And um, we don't have cities here, but city mayors have had a huge role because they're particularly mob motivated by driving down, uh, dr driving down air pollution, um, which is a big health issue that they're grappling with. Um, so for me, this is a response to the cry from the streets of systems change, not climate change. And the really exciting thing is that this kind of systems change only accelerates. We've seen the movie before, it's exponential. You know, I think two years ago, 2.8% of global vehicle sales, now seven. That's nearly a trebling in two years. If you extrapolate that kind of exponential change, then we'll be getting to 100% zero emission vehicles even earlier than 2035, which will be better for climate change, better for city air, um, and better for consumers' pockets, because not only the cost of ownership now, but quite soon the sticker price is going to pass the parity point. So with that, um, I'd like to thank a fantastic, di diverse, and systems-rich panel um, for bringing together all the different angles of international collaboration to drive this transformation. Thank you. And, I'm, and I should congratulate Helen on being able to pronounce fit for 55 better than Matthew. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for another excellent discussion. International collaboration is obviously crucial for ensuring that zero emission vehicles become the new normal by 2030 and that no market is left behind in the process. I've been told to get you to all sit still for a minute as we come to the end of this event. I want to thank all of you for joining, whether in person or virtually, and a special thanks to our speakers for sharing what they've been doing to support the global transition. And a final thanks to every single government, vehicle manufacturer, business, investor, and any other actor who sent a clear signal about the trajectory of the transition to zero emission vehicles by signing the declaration and the MOU. And so to close this event, we're going to watch a final video of Simon Armitage, the UK Poet Laureate, reading his inspiring poem about the need for clean air. Thank you, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed being part of this event, and I hope you have a fantastic time through the rest of Transport Day. In praise of air. I write in praise of air. I was six or five when a conjurer opened my knotted fist and I held in my palm the whole of the sky. I've carried it with me ever since. Let air be a major god, its being and touch, its breast milk always tilted to the lips. Both dragonfly and Boeing dangle in its see-through nothingness. Among the jumbled bric-a-brac I keep a padlocked treasure chest of empty space, and on days when thoughts are fuddled with smog, 
or civilization crosses the street with a white handkerchief over its mouth and cars blow kisses to our lips from theirs, I turn the key, throw back the lid, breathe deep. My first word, everyone's first word, was air.